Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden. My name is Magnus Sedlacek and I'm part of organizing Funk Prog Sweden meetup. And also warm welcome back if this is not your first meetup with us. Today we'll have three presentations. We'll have Type Safe Message Driven Distributed, a whirlwind tour of Akka by Johan Andrian. Uh, second presentation is Developer Ergonomics with VS Code Closure Closure Script by Peter Strömberg. And third presentation is Functional Programming Primer for Java by Deepu K. Sasidarian. I hope I pronounced the, your name right. Um, in the end, I'll do a little bit the schedule for the rest of the season and a summary. First up, we would like to thank our video sponsor, Adabit. Adabit is a small IT consultancy company based in Stockholm, where most of the developers have a background in functional programming. If you want to know more about Adabit, check them out on adabit.com or in social media. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the YouTube chat, and I will read out the questions to them. Or if you have feedback, just push it out in, in the YouTube chat. Uh, if you don't want to use the YouTube chat, just go to the meetup. You have the possibility to also comment under the, the actual meetup. So just post your question there or feedback, and I will push it to the, to the audience and to the presenters. With that said, let's start. Uh, first presentation, type safe, message driven, distributed, a whirlwind tour of Akka by Johan Andrian. Warm welcome, you won. Thanks for having me. Y yes, you're warm welcome. I'm super thrilled. We actually finally got a Scala guy here. <laughs> I've been actually looking for a Scala guy for, I don't know, a year. Where are you people? Now you one is here. Thank you very much and welcome. So I'll hand over the, the HDMI and hope it works. Maybe. Yay. So let's get started. Um, I work as a, as a developer in the core ACA team at a company called Lightband, uh, primarily known as the Scala company, but also maybe now more kind of moving into uh, focusing on ACA and also uh, serverless stuff. So for this talk, um, I have kind of chosen a, a good um, sampling of what is in in the ACA project and the Umbrella projects. Um, so we're going to cover uh, a bit of actor basics, uh, the idea of actors and how, how tho those look in, the, in, in ACA. And uh, then we're going to have a, an overview of components for building distributed systems uh, based on actors. Uh, but in the toolkit is uh, yeah, a gazillion of stuff. And there is a lot, that, lot of ground that we won't be covering in this talk. So, at the core of ACA is, is the actor model. Um, maybe known to you from, from other languages. Uh, so there is like the, prim the primary, the most known language that has actors is Erlang. But there's also a, a smaller, maybe less successful language called Pony. Um, and at some point, like 10, 11 years ago, uh, the, fo the founder of ACA, Jonas Bonner, thought uh, there needs to be an, an actor framework toolkit for, for the JVM, because this is a really good idea. <coughs> and the whole idea revolves around uh, avoiding concurrency primitives to do concurrency and distribution. Uh, and instead of doing nitty-gritty little uh, synchronized stuff and using primitives that is hard to get right every time, we, we um, abstract this to a model that, that makes it so that it, you, you get it right every time uh, without, without a large effort. Um, so each actor has an inbox, and the only way to communicate with it is by sending it messages through this inbox. And the uh, surrounding system, the, the, the actor system that manages the actor and the actor lifecycle, uh, will make sure that the actor processes a single message at a time. So you get a, a single threaded um, illusion to uh, for for interacting with state and stuff like that. 
So when an actor um, gets a message, it can do three things. It can uh, mutate state, so it can, has ha it can have its own state, but it can also have children and also mutate like its life cycle, so it can, for example, stop itself. Uh, it can send messages to other actors, so a uh, single actor isn't very interesting, but they always come in, in systems, so you have many of them, very likely. Um, and then the third thing an actor can do when it receives a message, when it processes a message, is to change its behavior for the next mes message that comes in. So this makes it possible to build state machines uh, with actors based on the incoming messages. Uh, I'm not going to do a lot of code in this presentation. Um, if that's what, what you came for, I, I can promise that the next speaker will do some live coding. Um, so please stay put and bear with me. But I will show some code. Uh, so we'll start with a very simple uh, actor with the uh, typed actor APIs that we introduced in Scala 2. Uh, in, in ACA 2.6. Um, so to build an actor, you start with defining a protocol. Usually the protocol is more of an ADT or uh, you have a, a marker interface and then a flat hierarchy of actual messages. So this uh, protocol type determines what kind of message that an actor can receive uh, and make sure that you get a compile error if you try to send something that is, um, isn't handled by the actor. So we have an, an older API, the classic actors API, where you don't have this kind of guarantees. And this is something that took quite a while to kind of formulate how we, how we wanted this to work and uh, how to actually implement it. So in this case, we have a very, uh, very silly example. We have a, s a single message protocol with a hello class who that contains a, s a single string, the who field. Um, when we define an actual the behavior for the actor, uh, it, it will have a type parameter that identifies this protocol. So this is part of how we guarantee that you can only send th this type of message to this, this actor, the, the kind of message that it knows how to handle. Um, then there's a bunch of behavior factories uh, based on this behaviors object. So in this case, uh, the, the most simple one is the receive message. It will simply get handed uh, an incoming message. And we get to do some form of processing. In this case, we do a, a print line, uh, standard out print. And then we re return like a special uh, marker factory thing called same, which means stay with this same behavior for the next message. So this actor, however many messages you send to it, it will always keep, keep having this behavior. To actually run this in an application, we need a, a main function, a main method, uh, and to start an actor system. So an actor doesn't run kind of on its own. It's not an object that you create yourself, but it's managed by this actor system. Uh, and once we have started it, the system becomes the reference to kind of the root the root behavior, the root actor of it. So we can send it messages. As you see, we send like two hello messages uh, with, the, with the tell method, the, the bang operator. And these are asynchronous, so um, the execution of the main thread will immediately kind of pass, b pass by these two, probably before the, the actor actually gets to process the messages and do the print lines. Uh, but the system will keep the application alive since it's a, a managed thing until this root actor stops itself. All right, let's do something more uh, interesting. Um, add some state. Uh, so we have the same protocol, but instead of um, making like a static behavior, we, we make a method that captures some form of state um, and returns a behavior. So in this case, we keep a counter. The first time when we when we create this actor, when we start it, we we call this with counter zero to return a behavior where the count is zero. And then for every message we receive, instead of returning same like we did before, we return a new behavior where we have increased the count with one. So this kind of looks like recursion, but but it isn't because the uh, control is handed back to the actor system between messages. So it doesn't actually call itself. It returns 
a new behavior with the increased count uh, value. So it's a kind of functional style way to, to represent state. Uh, it's also possible to do a more uh, class object oriented way, but this is very neat for a lot of cases. Uh, and also, of course, if your preference is functional programming, this is perhaps a better fit than the, the class-based. So this only kind of showed how to receive messages, but let's talk a bit about how actors can interact with each other. So what we saw in the, in the main method, that was a fire and forget using the bang or the tell method. So it will immediately send off a message and then the, the calling thread will continue with its logic. And all, all kind of messaging in, in actors, in Akka, will be asynchronous like this. There is no way to kind of block on a call to an actor or uh, kind of stop the current thread from doing stuff. Uh, and that's like at, at its very core in how things are designed with Akka. Um, so another very common one um, is request response. So this is kind of very close to, to calling a function or a method, but it is asynchronous. So you fire a message off and at some point in the future, you get a response. So you kind of react on the response rather than that you, you block a thread and wait for it. And then the third uh, would be that you, rather than you see it as a request response interaction, you actually send several responses. So you can call that a subscription. So an actor tells another actor, uh, you can send me messages of this type. And it will do it like, uh, when something happens or at a, at a repeated kind of interval or something. Um, based on these like three different ways of uh, interacting, you can, you can build a lot of stuff and I'm not sure if there is any kind of any more ways of interacting that is really important or uh, needs to be kind of uh, upfront kind of talked about. So let's look at an example where we actually do a, a request response style interaction. So in this case, we have a, not only like the string in this hello message, but we also have a reply to actor ref. So an actor ref is the kind of reference to a running actor. And the type parameter here, just like with behavior that we saw before, uh, limits what kind of messages we can send to it. So in this case, when uh, the actor gets this hello message, it can only reply with a string. So when we get this message, we, uh, we capture this reply to and we send a string back. And except for that, it's identical to the, to the previous example where we just kind of increase the counter by one. Um, and to show like the other side, how, the, how a request could look in this case, uh, we have a, a factor method for this that accepts an actor f to, to say hello to. Um, but our own behavior for this second actor behavior is string. So this is how we know that we can only get string messages to this actor. And that also means that uh, the reference to the running actor itself will be an actor f string, which is exactly what we had kind of designed in this little protocol. So when this actor starts up, we, we send a hello message and we pass it a reference to ourselves. Um, and then at some later point, we get a response message from the other actor. So this shows how uh, we react on this response rather than send or, or wait or block for, for getting it. And in this case, instead of returning same that we did before or a new behavior with some increased counter, we, we kind of change change the life cycle of the actor by returning behaviors.stopped to, to stop the actor. All right, so this was kind of the low detail code kind of stuff. Now I'm gonna kind of migrate into distributed systems uh, and a more kind of overview part of this talk. Um, so a distributed system is basically when you have written an application and you want to run it, kind of distribute it over several computers or several JVMs on the same computer, but uh, kind of several running processes that take part in the same application. So usually this is interesting because you want uh, fault tolerance. So you want to know that if the hardware of one machine breaks down and 
doesn't work anymore. You want your system to be able to handle requests still. Um, but it can also be about your problem outgrowing a single computer. So if you have a problem that doesn't fit into the memory of single computer, you want to kind of uh, scale that out over several computers to be able to, to handle uh, more load. There's some other kind of use cases as well, but I think those are kind of the two primary prim primary use cases. Maybe also if you if you run out of, out of CPU and need to scale that out, like more CPU than you can fit in one machine. Uh, and it also lets you kind of do this with commodity har hardware, so you can have like cheaper um, cheaper servers instead of buying a really expensive one with all the resources to run the application as one. Um, but of course, it comes at a cost. So uh, there's a good quote from uh, Leslie Lamport, which is a researcher in distributed systems. Uh, the dis a distributed system is one which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your, your own computer unusable. So hopefully this is something you want to avoid, but there is something to it. Um, so what we saw um, in these previous samples was me starting uh, several actors in one actor system. Um, a really cool thing about this is that it leans itself really well to distributing because messages between systems is essentially how um, computers talk across networks through packet packets and messages. Um, and it also kind of deals with the fact that um, you, you're not in the same memory space. So with actors, you have already modeled your messages, your interaction as immutable messages. There is no way uh, that a mutation of this message can change something on the sending side. Um, and also very like closely to the, the idea of it is that messages can be lost. So if the other actor has crashed when you send it, you might not know that and that, that message is lost. But across a network, then the risk is much, much higher that messages will be lost because networks are, uh, in their in their core nature, not quite not very reliable. Um, so f we can model this with messages and do resending. And also, one thing that kind of gets lost if you model this kind of stuff with RPC is that not only requests can be lost, but a request can succeed and then the the response gets lost. So you have actually succeeded in doing some operation on the other side, but but you don't know because you didn't get the response. But this will still look like a networking error that your RPC call failed. So with messages, this is easier to kind of model retrying around and uh, doing uh, idempotent kind of actions based on, an, on a message re and retrying it. Um, another pretty cool thing with the actor model for, for distributed systems is that you don't have to do a uh, request response chain that, that follows the same path. So if you have uh, an actor on one node that sends an act a message to an actor on a different node that in turn sends a message to an actor on a third node, the third actor can respond directly to the actor on the first node. It doesn't have, have to go through the, the intermediate actor. Um, and of course, like this messaging, as I showed in the, in the interaction examples, it's not limited to request response. You can do a lot of uh, different patterns where both sides can, can uh, start uh, an interaction or you can have many messages back and you can have streams of messages and stuff like that. All right. Um, so to do this, uh, an ACA actor system can take part of one ACA cluster, which is a peer-to-peer -peer based um, remoting kind of thing where, where nodes um, know of all the other nodes in the cluster. So to form a cluster, uh, there is a pro programmatic way to do it, to send a join message to an existing cluster or the node itself to kind of start a new cluster. Or you can do it through config. And those two are maybe interesting mostly if you are in a very kind of uh, static set of nodes, but nowadays I guess most people will be in a, in a more cloudy, dynamic kind of environment, which makes forming a cluster a bit trickier uh, through these programmatic or, or config-based solutions. So uh, for, for those, there is a whole kind of little umbrella subsystem thingy called ACA management uh, and cluster bootstrap, which uses 
for example, Kubernetes API to discover other nodes and form a cluster. So once a node is in the cluster, it will start gossiping with the other nodes. So the state of the cluster, which nodes are in it and, and their um, life cycle state, is an eventually consistent uh, data structure that on each node at some point will reach the same state. So when a node joins the cluster, um, the other nodes will start gossiping to, to their neighbors or their friends about that there is a new node in the cluster. And eventually all of the nodes will know of all the nodes in the cluster. And the same, same goes for like leaving, leaving a cluster. Um, there is a failure detector to detect if a node is no longer reachable. So this can be used partly to kind of divert uh, work to other nodes. And it is also possible to use it to get rid of the node if it turns out that it's not only temporarily unreachable. So this can be a, a bit tricky to, to know for sure with distributed systems. So uh, was this just a network connection that we lost for a while? Or was it actually this remote node that crashed that, that isn't there anymore? Um, so in the case of things going back to green again, so let's say that was uh, someone spilled coffee in the, into, the, into the router and now you put all the cables into your replacement router, uh, the cluster will know that this node became reachable again. You can kind of start, use it for, for uh, traffic. But it could also be that this node is permanently out of the cluster. You will never, you will never see it again. Um, and for this, uh, there's a component called the split brain resolver, which can kind of detect and remove those nodes from the cluster. This is also maybe more important in a, in a dynamic cloudy environment where you scale in and out dynamically and things like that. Um, so a tricky problem is partitions or split brain. That is, let's say your cluster uh, lost connectivity like between a part of the cluster. Um, so for example, a giant scissor attack. Uh, so it, with the kind of basic setting for ACA, this means that the nodes on both sides, they stay, uh, stay up for until this kind of um, problem is solved. And the things that ran on that side of the cluster can still continue running, uh, accepting requests, dealing with things. But usually when you, when you end up with this kind of problem, you would like to kind of shut one side down and continue with the, just like the other side to kind of rebalance and become one cluster again, because a lot of things uh, needs consistency, needs to be able to talk to each other. Um, and that's, that will not work as long as you have this kind of a partition. Um, so, yeah, there was nothing more there, sorry. Surprising animations. Um, so the user API of this is, is very kind of limited. Um, it's basically a way to know about the node itself that I'm in right now. The code that, that I'm uh, running in an actor can see, uh, am I in the cluster? Have I joined the cluster? Um, have I left the cluster? Uh, what is my address? Stuff like that. And I can also do programmatic kind of uh, operations to join the cluster or to leave the cluster again. And I can also do a programmatic downing of other nodes. Uh, not very often that is super useful, but you can do that. And I can also uh, listen for events to the cluster. So when the cluster topology changes, when new nodes come in, I can get, get an event to an actor. So I can tell it to do stuff once there are more nodes or less nodes, stuff like that. Um, Okay, before I start with the actual kind of cluster components, uh, this, is a, this is a new thing in the typed APIs called the receptionist. Uh, so the receptionist is the way to kind of look up other actors based on uh, a name and a type. So you define like a, a key that contains a name and a type, uh, and then actors that provide 
a specific service can register using this key. And actors that need someone that provide this service, they can either do like a single lookup and get the list of actors that fulfill this contract right now, or they can get a, do a subscription to get updates every time the set of uh, register actors changes. Um, and why I, when I, why I say this isn't like really uh, one of the cluster components is that it also works in a, in a non-clustered actor system. So you can write something that relies on this receptionist uh, and run it in a, in a single actor system without a cluster in your unit tests or stuff like that. And then it will uh, work clustered once you are actually running a cluster. And there are some other components that, that are based on this receptionist that we will see later. Uh, but also uh, routing, which basically looks like an actor F, but does some kind of round robin or uh, uh, random selection of actors that you actually send the message to, to kind of distribute work. Um, so it looks like this on every node, there's a receptionist, which is an actor in itself, but it, it comes uh, prepackaged with Akka. It's always started when you start the actor system. Uh, one actor, in this case our hello actor, it can register itself with a, with a key. And this is gossip to the other node, so it's also uh, just like the cluster states, in it, it's an uh, eventually consistent data structure, the, the registry, the set of re registered services. And then on some other node, or on the same node, I can subscribe to updates for this key. Um, and every time the set of registered services change, I get a listing. And I can then use this listing to uh, send a message to, to one of them, or all of them. Uh, for the case where I just want to send to one of them, we have this routers that I, that I mentioned earlier, and it kind of abstracts over the need to keep track of this listing. And instead you can just kind of say, this is the key, uh, send messages to the available actors with this key, like one of them at any time. All right, so let's go with the cluster tools. Um, so one quite important thing for, for the cluster tools is that there is a, a scale from strong consistency, consistency to availability. So if the angry scissors are out there again, cutting the cable, um, like a component can either always be available and be able to handle requests on both these nodes, even though they can't communicate with each other, or it can be strongly consistent, and that means it cannot uh, handle any requests until it can talk to the other node, basically. So for each of these components, I'm going to like say about -ish where it is on this scale. Um, so let's start with cluster sharding. This is maybe the most uh, used clustered component with Akka. Or if I look at like our customers and the user base of Akka, this is what most people use. Uh, together with event sourcing, the event sourced actor APIs, which require a single writer per, per ID. And cluster sharding provides guarantees around exactly that. Uh, so instead of sending a message to a specific actor, uh, the routing is based on an ID which is in, in the message. So it has a way to extract this ID from, from the message, and it makes sure that uh, there is only one actor with a given ID in the entire cluster at a given time. So when actually running, it will look something like this. It's a hierarchy. So each node has a shard region, and each shard region can have a, a bunch of shards, and each, each shard can have a bunch of sharded actors. Um, and when I send a message to, through this shard region with an ID, it will get routed to uh, a node where the right shard and actor is living. And if it isn't running yet, it will be started. Um, if the cluster topology changes and we remove that node where it used to live, it will be started on a new node. Uh, if we scale the cluster out, add more nodes to handle more load, for example, um, it will rebalance the existing shards across the cluster, so to kind of make use of all the nodes in the cluster. Um, the incoming message can come from any node on the cluster, so you don't have to kind of align this. You can actually put the load balancer in front and let it send requests to any node in the cluster. And this um, sharding routing will handle sending it to the right node from, from 
where it is uh, kind of turned from HTTP into actor messages, for example, or gRPC or whatever. Um, so this one is sort of um, strongly consistent. It guarantees that there is only one at a time of a, of a specific entity. So if there is a, a partition and unreachable nodes, uh, it cannot start new shards. Uh, it cannot rebalance. But those actors that were already alive can be interacted with. But I still decided to kind of put the arrow uh, closer to strong consistency than always available. But it's, it's not quite the truth. All right, let's look at the next component, um, distributed data. So distributed data is a component based on CRDTs, uh, conflict-free replicated data types, which is a way to allow um, a data structure to be updated updated on any node concurrently. And uh, those changes will then kind of be gossiped in the cluster and the data structures on each node will eventually reach the same kind of state. Um, it's not possible to use for kind of any data structure. It has some very special requirements. Um, so the operations need to be commutative. You need to be able to do them in any order. So for example, addition, if you do addition with, with a number, it uh, doesn't matter which order you put the numbers, it will always be the same result. Um, it is also important that grouping operations doesn't matter. You will always get end up with the right the same result. So this is also true for addition. And it also needs to be monotonic. Uh, we cannot kind of undo stuff. But there's some sneaky tricks around that. So uh, you can build your own data structures that kind of live up to these requirements. But there's a, a few built-in ones. So there's a counter that only increases. You can add to it on any node. So let's say uh, likes on a YouTube video. You could accept a like on any node in the cluster and eventually the counter on each node will reach the same state based on how many likes you have gotten. Um, there's also a PN counter which kind of handles both uh, adding and removing to this number by, by keeping two counters. How many additions were made and how many subtractions were made and then we can kind of calculate the, uh, the sum based on those two. Same goes for sets. We can have sets that we only add to, which is fine. Or we can do OR sets, which are uh, basically sets where we keep track of what was added and what was removed. Uh, and then some kind of more complicated uh, structures based on that, like maps. Um, and also like a very specific last rider wins map, which isn't that hard to, to build yourself without this. Uh, and then we also have like flags and registries, like flags where you can have a boolean that you can only toggle once. So in action, you will have a replicator actor running on each node. Uh, you can ask any of these replicators the value, the current value of the of a key, and you can subscribe subscribe to changes of one of these data structures to get updates every time it changes. And then you can update it on any node. And those changes will, will reach all nodes in the cluster. Um, so this is different from sharding. This will always be um, available. Even if you would partition the cluster into uh, one partition per node that couldn't talk to the rest of the cluster and have it like that for an hour, you could still accept writes. And you could still see like the local the local state, and then when you kind of fix the partition so that the nodes can talk, they will all kind of arrive at the same end state. All right, next component is distributed pub sub. So this is based on top of the receptionist. Uh, so it's very close to what we already have seen. It allows you to define a topic and then have subscribers, one or more subscribers or zero or more subscribers on each node of the cluster. And it will deduplicate message sending. So if you publish a message and there are more than one subscriber on a specific node, the message will only be sent to it once. Um, just like with the other tools, you can subscribe to the, or you have to subscribe to the topic to get updates, or to get messages. And then when you send messages to the topic, it will arrive at all the subscribers known at that time. Um, so this is 
another one of the always available kind. Uh, like the set of the registry of subscribers is uh, somewhat eventually consistent because it uses this receptionist. But it also means that if you have a partition and there is uh, a send on one side of the partition, it will never reach the other side because that is just how messages work. Uh, you cannot send messages across partitions because there is no network connectivity. Right. Next one, cluster singleton. Um, so this is something to avoid, but there are almost always scenarios where you want to have something that there is only one of for the entire cluster. So cluster singleton uh, guarantees this. Um, it will give you tools to send messages. It will manage like which nodes an actor runs on, which will always be the oldest node in the cluster. And then it has a proxy which allows you to send messages to it without knowing uh, yourself which is the oldest node. So we send a mes message through the proxy and it will pass that to the singleton actor. Uh, if that node is crashed, removed from the cluster, uh, the singleton actor will then be started on the new oldest node in the cluster. Um, but while it is unreachable, it will not be available for a while. So this is like a, you are introducing a single point of failure for sure. Um, so this is for certain strong consist strongly consistent and uh, you won't be able to interact with it and it won't be able to start a new one if, if unless uh, a cluster node where it lived was, was removed. Um, sometimes you want to do kind of that thing with the singleton, but you want uh, a specific set number of these. So a very common use case for this would be uh, consumers for Kafka. You want to run 10 consumers for Kafka across your cluster. If you scale your cluster down to five nodes, uh, you want two consumers per node. If you scale it up to 10 nodes, you want one consumer per node. Um, so this component is precise. You can't change that uh, across like a deployment. If you want to change it, you need to stop the cluster and start a new one with a new number. And it doesn't really have an API to interact with these uh, processes. That doesn't mean that that is impossible, but there is no kind of proxy or anything like that, like with the other tools. Uh, but they can still kind of use the receptionist, register themselves, or use the pub subtopic or something like that to, to receive messages. Um, and this is actually built on top of cluster sharding, so it's a composition of uh, another component. Um, this is also strongly consistent, but not always available. So it will, um, if you change the cluster topology, it will stop that thing for a while and start it on a new node potentially. Um, <clears throat> and if you, a node is unreachable, you might it might not be running. You don't know until you have removed it from the cluster. Right, that was the last component. Um, so in some scenarios, a single cluster isn't enough. Um, you might want uh, redundancy to be able to uh, tolerate a whole data center crashing uh, or losing power, I don't know. Uh, or you might also want to kind of co-locate um, actors for a user group with them geographically to kind of get, get better response times. Um, or just balance the load over a, a ton of servers, uh, make that easier maybe than to run a single cluster. Uh, so for this we have support for multi-DC. <clears throat> and each DC is uh, like a logical grouping, so it might be an actual DC or an availability zone or something like that, but it might also be just a logical kind of uh, a logical grouping of, of nodes in your cluster, in your application. Um, so each of these clusters will basically be like a separate cluster, but they can interact in between with messages. So actors in one data center can send, send messages to actors in a different one. Uh, so in the cluster tools, uh, if you run sharding, it will be like one set of sharding per data center. It will guarantee <coughs> one instance of an, of an entity, an actor, in the same data center, but not across data centers. Um, Distributed data and PubSub will work across them, I think. Uh, cluster singleton will also be per data center. So it will be 
three if you have three data centers, or you will actually decide to run it in just one of them and interact with that from the other data centers. Um, a quite recent addition is uh, replicated event sourcing, which is a combination of eventually consistent data structures and event sourced uh, data structures, where you can actually have multiple separate instances with their own data store running at the same time. <clears throat> so for this, you could have a, um, a persistent, uh, an actor that persists its state with event sourcing, but runs one instance per data center that are uh, eventually consistent. So if one data center goes down, you can keep writing to the same actor in a different data center. And then when the data, cent data center ca comes up again, you can, it will kind of catch up after a while. Um, yeah, so this is this is kind of the end of it. Um, all of these components are um, have a lot of documentation. We have put a lot of effort into documenting it in their in our uh, reference documentation. So you can find that uh, through the aka.io site. Um, on top of that, uh, discussion forums discuss.aka.io. Uh, we also have something called the platform guide, which is a more kind of high-level uh, description of how you write uh, distributed microservices with this and how you put it into production on AWS or GCP, like the, the Amazon or the Google Clouds. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're working on this like a serverless thing, so keep your eyes open for what is, what is coming there because it will be pretty cool, I think. All right. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I haven't received any questions so far, but I have some questions on my own. Right. Uh, first, I would like to thank your presentation. I think it was really good on the uh, present presenting, like eventually consistent, how it works, what it works. I love the, the thing with the scissor attack. I never heard of that <laughs> before. <laughs> <laughs> so well, known, well known technical yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes um, how come you started up using Scala and then went into Akka oh um, so so like Java has seen a, a ton of changes the last mm -hmm. four or five years uh, since maybe even since Oracle took over from Sun mm -hmm. it started getting things rolling again uh, but at that point in time, five, ten years ago, uh, it was kind of stale, and you didn't see a lot of kind of interesting language improvements that are first now they are arriving in the language, right? Mm. With the uh, Java 16, 17, um, and it was like a whole new world that kind of opened up to me. Um, so at at university, I, I studied Haskell and all these things, and and I never kind of saw the practical application. But then all of a sudden, having access to a language that could do that wi within reason okay. uh, on the JVM that I could that I could use at actual companies to build <coughs> actual software and not only as a as an interest or a hobby, uh, work with a team to build something concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really interesting. And I think also like as a language having one leg in the industry and yep. one leg in the academic world. Mm? That made it also very different from a lot of other angle languages, with, which would be either. So Java would be in the industry only and not caring about ideas, new ideas about type systems or mm. stuff like that. And languages like Haskell would be like only in the academic world and super interesting, but so far from being something that you could introduce in, in, your, in your workplace. Or yep. Yes. Where did Akka come up with the idea? Did it take it from Erlang, the message? Uh, yeah, so I mean... It, was so it any, any other <laughs> particular or any other language? Or? So, so I mean, the actor model as an idea, mm. of course, like uh, the, ac the academic ideas mm. from the 70s maybe mm. even. Uh, but there was certainly a lot of inspiration from, from Erlang. Yeah. Uh, that Interesting. Uh, and then you shared a lot of sources in the end. We'll share it under the film or on the YouTube later so everyone can find them. Uh, and uh, we'll also share your contact stuff so they can find you if they want to ask you questions or want right. to know more. Sounds good. Yeah, or want to work with you and are super interested in getting to know Akka more. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks again. You won. Thank you. Then we'll start up the next person. Uh, I will put in my the presentation. See if I can get it up and running. And we're gonna get uh, you one or not you one. We're gonna get Peter Strömberg up on stage. Pop it up here. Yay. So, warm welcome, Peter, Thank to you. Uh, Funkprog Sweden. Thank you, you very much. Do you want help with that? I think... Uh, Do you need power? I need power, yeah. Yeah. One thing that Wi-Fi hasn't solved, power, distributed power. So I will just go it's on the... It's there. Yeah. So <laughs> I can dive. Yes. We're still waiting for wireless, wireless, what do you call it, over-the-air energy. Yeah. Yes. Pipe dream. Yeah, exactly. Um, let so me just uh, fix one thing here and then I will sure. be ready to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Um, so, next presentation, developer ergonomics with VS Code, closure, closure script. Um, by Peter Strömberg. And I guess uh, in the picture, Peter, you're the bigger guy, not the smaller guy. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Or is it the young engineer, maybe? Excuse me, uh, maybe a uh, coming engineer. The coming engineer. Will he hack your, he or she hack your phone? She, she will certainly hack it. Yes. She will certainly hack it. Nice. Yeah, then I think I'm... Are you done? Uh, I will, then we'll pop over the HDMI cable. Yeah. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. And we'll see if it works. Joohoo, it works. It works. Welcome. Thank you, Magnus, and thank you for inviting me here. Yo. It was, um, it was uh, really, I, mean, I, I love closure. So if I come up a bit, out a bit uh, religious about the thing, uh, <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, because closure. It literally changed my life yep. for the better. So it's, uh, it's I love this opportunity to uh, to steer, say, tell people about it. So uh, who am I? I'm Peter Strömberg. I also listen to the name Pez. And uh, uh, for what I do when I want to have fun is spend time with my family and also code. So those two things. Uh, maybe the most fun there is spending time with my, f with my wife, because she's very fun. <laughs> she makes me laugh all the time. And then at daytime, I am a mobile app developer using these tools that I'm going to show you today. And um, we're trying to improve people's health. Uh, using technology at Piloxa. So today's uh, tool uh, here will be, of course, be closure, closure script, and how that uh, is brought into Visual Studio Code by a tool that I have made called Calva. So let's uh, let's begin with. Uh, a bit about closure then. So this uh, talk has the name, the word ergonomics in it, and that's that's actually what has struck me with this, with this language. The way I found it was that I was uh, at a at a fintech startup, and where the devs brought in uh, closure. It was a greenfield uh, project, and the devs brought in closure, and I could see how they had this immediate feedback while they were working. So I got very, very interested in, in, in it, and I also wanted to do it. And since it was full stack, and they let me play a bit with it on the closure script front end of, of things. And yeah, that's, uh, that's how it started. And then I realized that I, I, need, to, I need to become a closure programmer myself. And, and have that as my work, because then that would make work perfectly fun for me. So, closure, it's a Lisp. Uh, and as 
we heard before, LISP could be at this academic end of things, but closure is not really. It's found, founded, founded like on papers and all these great ideas that come from the universities and stuff like that, but it's a very practical and pragmatic uh, language. You can use it in the industry for about anything, I would say. And it's made practical, practical by this idea that it should be easy to make things simple. And um, yeah, so, so I would say closure is there. It, at least it makes it very much easier. There is still pain to be pay, paid for the gain, but it's certainly easier. The big thing about it, and that what I will focus on today, is interactive programming. I will speak a bit more about that, what it means, uh, uh, but that is the big thing, uh, at least as I see it. Closure is a hosted language. It started on the JVM, uh, but it also exists on the JavaScript VM as, in, as Closure Script, and it also there is also one uh, closure for, for the CLR, and uh, even for the Erlang VM, you have uh, closure, if you like. The uh, thing about closure is that it's functional, functional first. It's not maybe not pure as uh, Haskell or something like that, but it's definitely functional first. And it's also immutable by default. It Things are immutable, so you can trust that they won't change on your feet. But you can also easily mutate things in a thread safe way. Uh, and this immutability gives us value semantics. You can compare even complex uh, data with each other. And if they contain the same thing, you will have equality. It's, uh, that's very powerful. And it also has very rich uh, uh, literal data types. Uh, and this together, I would say, makes Clojure more data-oriented than most things you have seen before. It's uh, when you work with Clojure, you work like often from, from the bottom and up. You don't design so much from the top and finding out relationships and stuff like that. Uh, instead, you, you you actually create a data structure from, from, from the bottom. So one of the eye openers for, for me was that looking at my colleagues at this fintech, when they worked, they so often just hammered out uh, an example data structure in, in the REPL and started to talk about it and uh, started to transform it. And, uh, and that looked to me very interesting. And the next time I really uh, was uh, struck by this was at Piloxa, where the Niklas, my colleague who, he, who recruited me, we were going to remodel a thing, a uh, central thing in the app, and he sat for a few hours at his desk, and then they asked me to come over, and on his computer, that was a data structure with examples. And I was a bit confused by this because I think it was like an architectural session we had, but it actually was. So from that data structure, we could, he asked me, Peter, does this make sense? And I looked at the data and some of them, uh, things I immediately saw, we could probably need to tweak and then, but we still have that data structure in the system uh, today. So it's uh, very much built from, from the bottom up. Speaking about ergonomics then, uh, this nil safety I think is a big thing. In nil is the closure null thing. But unlike in many other systems where null is the value of death, you should be really scared if you get null somewhere because if you call something on null, everything will blow up. That's not the, the, the thing in what's happened in closure. Most functions, they accept nil as a friend. So, uh, so you, you can you, you can let nil happen, and the functions you use and the functions you should create do something sensible with it. It's also very strong abstractions. It's very much built from abstractions, and I highlight the sequence abstraction, which I think is uh, 
this uh, like central in, in enclosure. So you get every almost everything you work on, on can be treated as a sequence. It has three functions you can call on it, and so, so you can yeah. And, and with this abstraction, you, you you build most things in closure. I would say it has very uh, uh, rich standard library. Uh, it has I would say just the right things in in the core library. So you don't need to bring in very much else just uh, to do a lot of the things. But then also, the, these, uh, this standard library is very stable. And Clojure is very stable. So I think like if you wrote a Clojure program on the first version of Clojure back in 2008, I don't, somewhere around there, that program still runs on the latest Clojure. Um, <coughs> and it, it usually said that it grows by libraries. So this, this uh, core library, it, it stays there and stable, and then, it, uh, then the community and the people creating, creating closure, they create libraries to extend it. And all those libraries also have this cultural, culture of keeping things stable. It's very common that you come to GitHub, for, for, from, for a library uh, you're interested in, and you see the last commit was two years ago. For some, some in some uh, ecosystems, that that means stay away from this. It's not maintained anymore. In Clojure, it often means it is done. So, in Clojure, a lot of the libraries reach a done state, which I think is very, very powerful. Another thing with with Clojure, because it is a Lisp, it is. I will try to say this word. It has homo iconicity. Yeah. <laughs> it, it basically means that closure itself is expressed in the same way that the data is expressed. So closure code is data. And that means that you can that you can use all of closure to modify closure code. And if you remember Max Nordlund, uh, uh, I think was his name, uh, speaking here a month ago, something about about um, meta programming with with, with uh, Erlang, he told you that in C, for instance, also has macros, uh, but it's like on the text level, and in Erlang, Max told us that it's like on the token level. In Clojure, it's on the full syntax level, since Closure code is also closure data and vice versa. And this drives this that closure can grow with uh, libraries. So some some of the closure libraries that, that you use are they're very like they look like they belong in closure, uh, but they are actually just done with macros. So that it's very powerful. And also this, uh, that code is data, and uh, it has structure. I think you, maybe you can compare it to XML. Maybe it's not as verbose as XML, of course, but that's, that's a structural language. Uh, and since you have this structure, it also enables structural editing, something that uh, uh, closure uh, IDs and editors uh, will take uh, full advantage of. It's uh, un under active development. It's taken very good care of the from the people who created it. Uh, Cognitech and Cognitech was recently acquired by this uh, huge unicorn bank in Brazil. So it's very well funded as well. It has a very engaged community. And Cognitech is taking part in this community there. Community guy, Alex Miller, he's taking full part in, in the community. He leads by example, and he has created, I would say, maybe the most inclusive and welcoming uh, community, uh, programming community that I have seen. I mean, when I, st when I joined, it was, it was all welcoming and people helping me. And yeah, so I'm, I'm so grateful for this. It also have a very 
str uh, strong open source community, and uh, which I am a part of. I know what I'm talking about here. It's also funded by the community to some part. It's also funded by dependent businesses in a very interesting model. And also Cognitech has, has uh, taken a strong stance for, for uh, sponsored uh, and funded open source. So they are directing six figure dollars yearly uh, to, uh, to fund and, and support open source. Still no one can live <laughs> As an open source developer here, but it's—I mean, it's—it's uh, it's certainly, it's certainly very uh, good as an open source development that you can get some uh, um, some um, money for your work as well. The REPL. I mean, if you have heard of anything of closure, you have heard of this REPL, and lots of programming languages have REPLs, of course, but. Few of them have REPLs like closures. They need to be a Lisp you know, to have it. Uh, and what it, it is, it's like REPL is uh, the thing that reads the, the closure code and evaluates it uh, and, and then uh, prints it back uh, to you and then loops back. And all closure code is written like that. So when a closure program is, is, is like, instantiated in a way. That's the closure reader reading each form one by one and just evaluating the format, the program into existence. So the REPL is actually like living inside your, the, the app you're building. And then also you, you can plug this uh, REPL into the, to the editor. And then you can, through your editor, modify the app as it is running. So uh, you develop things in small building blocks, as I said, often data first, and, and then you, you iterate on it, and the program grows like under your fingers. And very seldom you restart. One of the like, biggest closure uh, applications out there, uh, uh, I think it's like the developer there, he has never restarted it. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's... Um, it's, it's uh, quite amazing. And I would say that when you, when you work like this, have your editor, uh, it's like you, you, you bring on the editor as your suit. And then you, pro, you control your program. So maybe this <laughs> metaphor here with Iron Man doesn't hold. Uh, I think like if you can have a metaphor with Iron Man, you should. So here it is. Uh, but anyway, when he is suited up, he gets, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, he gets one with this machine and can control it. Of course, uh, uh, he, as you saw, it takes, a if you've seen the movie, it takes a while before he actually gets in control of it. And maybe with closure, it takes a bit longer than he did uh, with that. Uh, a friend of mine actually said that it's also like a potter's, uh, wheel, uh, so you, you can feel with your fingers, like have contact with, with the application as it's as it is created, and you you form it. So yeah, maybe that's that's uh, the better metaphor of these two. Uh, but uh, I will show you. Maybe that's better than throwing metaphors at you. So let me just say a few words about Calva. So I, I created Calva uh, because I wanted to stay with my favorite editor and there wasn't very good uh, closure support on VS Code then. Uh, so <coughs> then I, I, re I re released the first version of uh, Calva uh, three years ago and uh, it was very quickly picked up. So I think like, I don't know how many weeks it was. I had 1,000 downloads. And then Linus, uh, my colleague there <laughs> at, at uh, this fintech startup, he threw a, a bit of a party at the office for this by cake and stuff like that. And then I realized I had a product. And then the product owner in me woke up. And, and I, 
I started to decide that, okay, I should make this uh, to something that is just not like, so, you, so that you can use VS Code. It should also be that you want to use VS Code. And so, Cal is very actively developing, developed by me and Brandon Rinch. Uh, and the thing uh, with any editor uh, extension helping with closure is that it must support interactive programming. So it, it is creating these closure documents, if you like, in VS Code, where the REPL is hooked in, and then the, that REPL lives in, in the application. So you, through Calva, you have control uh, of the application. And it also has, has strong support for this structural editing that, the, that is enabled by, by the structural nature of Lisp. And uh, it is a complete uh, development uh, environment. So it has syntax highlighting, formatting, everything like that. Uh, that you, uh, so that is a bit maybe uncommon in the closure world that you have one thing doing all of it, but that's, uh, that's how Calva is, is built anyway. And unique for Calva uh, so far is, is this getting started REPL. Because we want to, and I want to, enable people to easily use uh, closure. Sometimes it takes a while to get the tooling together and stuff like that. So you want to you uh, make that easier, and that's what I've tried to do with this uh, getting started REPL. So there is a page for it here, but the thing with it, it, uh, it leaks in, in VS Code as a command, fire up the getting started REPL. And what it will do, it will open up three files for you. One is to, trying to teach you the basic of, of interactive programming with, with Calva, and the one is trying to teach you about structural editing, and one about closure. The one about closure is not finished yet, but it's, it's there, and you can start learning closure that way. Enough talking. You one promised you some live coding. Here it comes. So we see so in in uh, in VS Code you have the command palette and you find the fire up this getting started REPL. And I will create new files. The three files that I promised opens up. The REPL is started, the, the application is is uh, is uh, 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 it's now started. You see it here in the output window. Maybe I need to increase it a bit for you. That it prints this hello uh, thing here. That's because that's the last thing that you find in this, uh, in this file. So uh, remember I told you that the, that the closure program is built like the reader is reading each expression one by one. And the final thing it, 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 uh, it reads, uh, that, is, that is the result of the evaluation. That's what we see here. Uh, and then this file tries to uh, teach you the, uh, how, how you, you get started with evaluating something. Because evaluation of uh, expression is the thing. So let me... I think you will see what, what, which keys I, I'm pressing. So here you have a, a function, uh, and it has a, like a documentation string. It takes one argument uh, s, and then it will uh, it will return a concatenation of hello s and bang. Uh, and to get this uh, function to be created, I need to evaluate it. Of course, now I have loaded this file, so it is already. Uh, uh, there, but I press Alt and then Enter, and that will evaluate this form, and it will define uh, this um, greet function in the namespace that we were, were in, and the namespace we are in is hello REPL. So it will create a, a var, it's called, which will hold the value which is this fu the function in this case, and it will bind that 
to this uh, symbol so I can use it in my code. And then to call this function, what you do in uh, often do as a closure coder is that you you put comment uh, blocks in in your file uh, because a comment is comment is a macro. Uh, it's defined like this, so it's this is like documentation and some metadata, but here is the actual function here where I have the cursor. That's nothing. So it returns nil. Uh, so that means that when the closure reader reads this, it just gets to be nil, and you, as I told you, nil is, is fine. Um, and as that is how you do work in Calva, things in, in this comment block are also, you can also evaluate them with, with the same command, uh, alt enter. So now I evaluated the function call to greet and it, uh, <coughs> and it uh, greeted us with this. And I can, of course, and evaluate that. And that is, uh, so the result of calling this function is this string that's printed here and it's shown here. And of course, you can also uh, print stuff that's like a, have the side effect of printing something to stand it out. And you do that with print line, that's just as in Scala. And <coughs> then if I call this, the result is nil, but uh, it's also printed here. And of course, sometimes you need to evaluate and something that's smaller than the whole function uh, you're working with. And so then you have a command for, for evaluating uh, just the current form. So if I have the cursor beside this vector here, and I press control and, and enter, it will evaluate uh, that vector. That's a literal, so it evaluates to itself, of course. I can also uh, evaluate this string the same way. It evaluates it also to itself. I can evaluate this two. It evaluates to itself. And I can also evaluate this symbol, foo, here. Of course, it's hidden in this comment form. So the reader hasn't evaluated that one. So foo doesn't exist yet. So that blows up here. But if I then do alt enter here, I have the find foo in this namespace. And now if I evaluate foo, it will evaluate to, to, um, um, to the, what is defined as, as this vector. Uh, yes, one more convenience ergonomic evaluation uh, command in Calva is you can evaluate everything up to the cursor in, this in, in the current and closing form. So say I have this uh, data structure. It, uh, it's, a <coughs> it's a board game called, uh, called Express. I can recommend playing it with your family. It's fun. I evaluate that. So now that exists in, the, in this namespace. And then I evaluate this function as well. It takes a collection sequence, a collection. And then it will c calculate the mean on that collection. Let me get that into existence as well. And here I'm using a threading macro, the thread last ma macro. So it will take whatever is here, which is, of course, this uh, data structure that we have defined it as. And, and then it will uh, call the next function with that as an argument, as a last argument. That's the thread last here. So it will be put here. And then the result of that function call will be handed to next function last and put there. And then that will be to the next function and so on and so on. So this is very common pattern in, in, in closure. It's, it's like pipelines uh, uh, transforming uh, 
data for you. So here, if I use this uh, um, function that um, this command that evaluates up to the cursor, and I use it standing there with the cursor, it will evaluate uh, this um, uh, two cold express. It threads there. If I have the cursor here, it will call the function, this function, on this uh, data structure. This is a keyword. And keywords in enclosure are also functions. So when you use them together with with a, with a hash map dictionary, if you're from Python, uh, it will look itself up in, in, in the map. So it will pick up the, out the ratings here, and that's the, this map, as you see here. And then I, if I do the same thing here, that will call the function vols on this, on this so you get the, the values. <coughs> and then I will the last thing in this thread is calling this function average with these values. And that is, this is a very fun game to see the high rating. And of course, this is the full uh, ex expression here. Uh, so you will be uh, able to also use Alt Enter here to, to have the same result as just doing the last one. So those three. Uh, uh, evaluation commands will take you far. Uh, you, you can evaluate the top level thing, that's often a definition of something, and you can evaluate just one, one thing with control enter, and you can evaluate up to something with control alt enter. Yes, and then this file goes on to teach you about trying to get you to to evaluate and evaluate away. So that's the mood, mood you need to be in when you work with uh, when you work with closure. And I can also show you this. It says said it's a hosted language, so you can also call very easily call down to to the host uh, host platform. So this is calling the Java function uh, math apps. Uh, oh, so if I evaluate this, that that will happen. And this is also a very common function range that will create, uh, in this case, something, uh, a sequence from 0 to 9. Uh, this sequence will be lazy. It's good to know. It's sometimes it um, has, yeah, you, 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 it, it's not always ergonomic uh, in that case, but it's, it's for a purpose. It's very powerful that you know that you have lazy sequences, uh, but sometimes it it uh, it, uh, it can surprise you. But anyway, so this is what it evaluates to. Calb also has a debugger, uh, which I which is really good in, in some situation, of course. But with the REPL connected into the application, very often you don't need you don't need uh, the the debugger. So the way I would debug this simple. Uh, and, and a contrived example uh, is so we have a function here bar takes one argument n and then this condition uh, macro it it takes a test uh, expression test expression test and every for when a test is true that expression will be returned and then it will short circuit and stop doing anything more so it, this one will test first if n is uh, bigger than 40, and if so, it will return n plus 20. And otherwise, it will check if it's bigger than 20, and then it will return the result of that. Else, here is a keyword, because and keywords are truthy. So it's just convention that you should name this else, this, this, uh, this condition. Uh, and then, if I call this function, first I need to get it into existence because it's hidden in this comment block. And then I call this function, and we see that it hits this else block here, of course. But if I call it with 24, it blows up. So something is wrong here. And then uh, the task here is to find out what's wrong. And what I will do is, would do most often, is that I, I'm, 
I would want to evaluate this. But I can't, because n is not, it's like local into this function, right? It's not, doesn't exist in the namespace. Uh, and then I would like to evaluate uh, in, inside this function. But to be able to do that, I often do this. I put a def form in here, and I define the namespace variable n to be the local, get the value of the local variable, value n. And then, if I call this function again, it will still blow up, but I will have captured n. So if we look now at n, what? No, I need to first reevaluate this function. Sorry. Now call it. Now look at n. So it has the value 24. Now I can look at this function. So I can, oh, that's false. That means this will not happen. I put the cursor there. Oh, that's true. That means this will happen. So what happens if I evaluate this? Okay, we have we are targeting in here on the pro on the problem, which is of course here that I'm calling first, which is one of these sequence abstraction functions on an integer, and that doesn't work. So we have found the problem. So very often with uh, closure. You use the REPL like this, and the fact that it is in, in, in uh, you can modify the, the application. So data is immutable, the application is immutable. That's the, the, the way it's wired up. Yeah, and this one also shows you some, some of this structural editing. Uh, it, it stops you from deleting the structure, because if I, if I delete this, uh, uh, closing paren here, then the structure will be broken. The center cannot hold. Uh, so everything is, is uh, uh, out of everything. No, all bets are off if I, if I delete that. So Calva will, will uh, help you not do it. So it will just move the cursor. Now, this of course I can delete. And if I delete, so this is how uh, what what th this uh, thing in, in this uh, Getting Started app will try, try to teach you. And I can also show you a bit more. This structural thing makes, makes me, I can, I can with uh, some uh, keyboard shortcuts, I can modify uh, the structure very easily. And then if I then evaluate this, and we can run it, and that's, that's what that function does. So, or I said we, we won't uh, go in here and learn more about structural editing. If you get curious about this, I really recommend you to do it. Uh, but we will look a bit here, this closure guide, because it's, it's rather big. It's so far almost 2,500 lines, uh, which is a lot in closure. And you, okay, of course, most of it is, is comments. That's how the guide is. Is, uh, is written. It's by far not finished, but it's enough there for you to start learning closure. So you, what you should start with, and, and any file you open in closure, especially with Calva, it needs, you need to let the REPL have it and evaluate it. Otherwise, like nothing really works. So there's a one shortcut for that. Now you see this message here, which I have put down here. That's the last thing in this file. Now it's loaded, now it's fine. Here you see maybe the shortest Hello World program in any programming language. This is the full Hello World program. Uh, and uh, no parents. <laughs> if you're uh, scared of parents, you see the Hello World doesn't have them. Of course, this is jokingly, but very common thing when you, if you, if you think about the Java Hello World, it has a lot of boilerplate around it. Uh, so very little boilerplate in, in Clojure. Very often uh, the solutions are, are small and very maintainable. And uh, again, we try to encourage experimentation here. Everything in Clojure is an expression. 
Uh, so this function here, it has four expressions. And the last expression that is evaluated by this function is the one that gets the result of this expression. There are no return statements because there are no statements in closure, only expressions. So if I define this function like that, and uh, if I would call it, it would f first uh, evaluate this, which prints this, and then it will evaluate this, it returns one, then it will evaluate that, and then it will evaluate that. So let's see if I'm, I'm correct here. Did I? I evaluated it. Right. Yeah, great. Then if I call it, that is actually what happened. Side effect one, side effect two, and then two. What happened with one? It disappeared. It could have found the next uh, unknown prime number. All for naught. Because it's evaluated there, never used, it just disappears. Only this two will exist after, like, because it's returned as the result. And yeah, so how much time do I have? Four minutes. Uh, oh, that's little. Yeah, I would want more because I w would want to show uh, a bit of uh, how application development is Do we? done. I can switch to that instead and yep. instead of showing more of this. Uh, so here I have an application. And um, let me... Here it is. This application is built with... Uh, Closure script, shadow sale JS, which is compiling a closure script and also doing hot reloading. And it's hot reloading deluxe, I would say. So it's uh, it will keep the state of the app as the as the application is is modified by me, by my editor. So for instance, if I would uh, uh, okay, I can show you that it is actually the editor here is connected to this application by evaluating this uh, function. So that happens inside the app. And I can then, let's say I change the background color here. And then let's save this file. You see, you see that, oh, okay. This is, I need to, no, that was the wrong. I need to disable the built-in fast refresh because that doesn't really work with this. So let me make, give us some state here. Now we have uh, clicked six times here and we, put it back to white here, and I save the file. Uh, the background color here will, will, will show that we have modified the app. The state is still there. Six, uh, the six is still there. Imagine that it's much more complicated state. You need to uh, click through the application and, uh, and um, enter data everywhere and stuff to get to that state, and you want to fix a bug there, or just fix how it looks. Uh, then, this is super, super powerful. Uh, so let's see here. Yeah, I can modify this a bit more. Uh, you don't really click things in an, in an application like that. Well, look, let's look at this, uh, what we have here. This is uh, a, d a data structure, vectors that you know, declaratively um, defines this screen here. So it has a React Native view and then a React Native text, which has this uh, tapped encounter. And it has a button, which has um, an, something happens when you press it. 
and uh, it has a text click me let's say it says tap me like that and uh, it has an image of that. so that's how this uh, that's the structure of this one the it starts with uh, uh, defining uh, two variables uh, so this counter which is the result of this subscription I'm using reframe uh, in this application which is a it's a framework for handling state in uh, in your in your application it's very similar to redux and these both of these are like modeled from from uh, from elm uh, how elm ha handles this i don't remember what what um, what is called in elm if you do then uh, type it in the chat so here uh, it's subscribing uh, to this uh, subscription. So if I evaluate this, it will actually uh, give me what's what's in this counter. So if I tap this some more and then evaluate this again, that's actually what's what, what, what's in the state. And also in the state here we have the value of this subscription subscription, and I can evaluate. That's true. That's why we can tap this because here we set the disable. Uh, from that variable, but we can dispatch here with with reframe, and I will dis dispatch this event, which sets which sets this to false. And you see, the button there turns uh, disabled. I can't click it. And I can also do what what happens when I press press this button. I can dispatch this myself. Uh, that so even though I can't uh, press the button now I can I can uh, let's re-enable it so what happens when I dispatch this then this application is built uh, using this top-down uh, thing I told you it's like at the, at the bottom of it it's just a data structure this is the data uh, in this so it has a counter it starts with zero and it's uh, the, this uh, if it's apple not is true and it also has two um, uh, fibonacci numbers there uh, hinting a bit of what i would like to do if i have the time to show it uh, so i'm going to tell me to to go on uh, right so Let's say uh, then. Okay, so that's uh, the, that, that's the database. The event that I'm dispatching is defined here, and it's uh, it's uh, th these events are taking the database as the input, and then they will do something and return a new database. That's how how the application state is is updated. And uh, this ink counter it update the database, the key counter in the database, that key, and it will call the function inc on it, which just increment it to one. If I would redefine this function to uh, do more inks, and redefine it, and now if I tap this button, it will count by threes instead. And uh, then the subscriptions are also functions that take the database and some argument, and then they will return something calculated from that database. Uh, so what we could do if we wanted to do Fibonacci numbers here instead is that we could have this, uh, look at this data structure, which is now the last two, and think about what we would want to do to uh, to get the next uh, uh, Fibonacci number in the sequence, and then we could define an event that looks like this: leg event db, and let's say uh, we call it advance. No, 
lens fib. And we see that it's a function which takes the db. And like the encounter, we don't care about the arguments we get. And then what we do here is uh, that we that we will um, uh, let's see here. we will update the db update takes a um, data structure and it takes something a uh, key in this data structure so what was called in the database it was called last fibs right uh, so we take last fibs and update that and we apply a function on it so we define that function here and this function gets like the two last Fibonacci numbers so I will destructure them from here fib1 and fib2 and then I will return a new vector that is fib2 and then the sum of fib1 and fib2. So this, this um, event will uh, uh, hopefully update the database with, with uh, uh, the next Fibonacci pair. And then we need a subscription uh, so I will array sub, and we can call it uh, current fib. Why not? And it's a function. It takes a database and gets another argument that we don't care about right now. And we will then uh, uh, just. Call. We will. We can use a thread uh, here, and we take the database, and uh, we take the what was it called? Current fibs, last fibs, last fibs from that database, uh, and then we return the first thing. If we define this, now in our application, if we, if we um, put the counter instead, call the subscription we just made with current fib, I think. This one should return one now, because that's what we have there, right? And if we make the button here dispatch, uh, advance pip instead uh, save this uh, now one is the current thing so now in theory if I click this button it should give me the next no it didn't blow up is null. So I don't really know why this uh, blew up. db in, update it with so this one is defined, right? This one is defined. The current fib. And save there. Reload the app. And I tapped here, right? And then it crashed on us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I think uh, I failed at this. <laughs> uh, 
at this uh, demo. I don't really don't understand why. So, advanced fib. It's there. And I dispatch that there. So, if I violate that, it blows up. Oh, actually, I don't uh, I think the time is running out for us. Uh, maybe I will come back and do some more successful uh, live coding uh, for you. Uh. Thank you very much anyway, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> I think it was very brave of you to do like live coding. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Maybe too brave, but... No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> hmm? I mean, this is the proof you don't have to succeed <laughs> 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 to do live coding. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you could rehearse it. <laughs> but I guess you're going to come up with a solution. You know what we do? We put the solution under, we're going to... I mean, we make... Um, we cut this into three, like your piece into one film. Yeah. We'll put the solution under your film or a link to it. Yeah, great. And then you can yeah. show it. I will show. Hmm? Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, question. Yeah. You said you went religious when you met or when you started working with Clojure. What did you work before? Everyone wants to know. So I was, a, um, immediately before I was a product owner on this uh, fintech hmm? startup. So I wasn't going well. And before that I was a product owner at another uh, company. So for a long time I hadn't been coding yeah. uh, uh, at all. Uh, Interesting. So you were like more like a product owner and then you yeah. find closure and went back to coding yeah exactly uh, so that's why i said it it, uh, it uh, so changed my so closer to product owners <laughs> yeah <that's laughs> what could be dangerous could be dangerous <laughs> they start coding <laughs> yep yeah yes you have any more questions yeah oh, i uh, didn't get any yes um how come you call it calva any special reason yeah so that's um that's um um the most used uh, editor uh, extensions for Emacs, and it's called Cider. Mm, yes. So, and if you know anything about you do how you make mm. Calvados, it's that you distill it from from Cider. So, and and Calva uses a lot of the Cider infrastructure. Yep. So it's distilled from Cider. Yes. We got one comment from a guy. Uh, return. Oh, you can read it yourself if you can see it. Return. Uh, Oh, sorry. Return parenthesis instead of. Maybe we solve it this now in the live code. It. My God. Let's see. This is more like mob pro programming now. Yeah. Yes. Or uh, meetup programming. We understand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was the thing. My God, we solved it. The community solved it for you. Yeah. They the power of the community. Yeah. Thank you, whoever it was. Yes, uh, thank you very uh, much. Let's see that it actually works then. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Uh, so then, if uh, we bring back, our let's see, can we run it here? Yeah. Tap it. And then, oh, sorry, I should say there. Yeah. And tap here. No. Yeah. It's sorry. It's it's uh, this is uh, React Native uh, playing tricks on me. Now, if I tap this. We still don't. Hmm. Still one more issue to solve. One bug, one bug down. Twenty more to go. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's no, actually, now we can dispatch it <laughs> without errors. Yeah. So this might be just a, a matter of. Uh, yes, I had one more comment actually. Yeah. Yeah. So your daughter. No, no, no. No worries. <laughs> oh. uh, your daughter said hello in the chat also. Oh, thank to know. you. Yes. Which, which one of them? Uh, good question. Don't know. Roxbox. Don't know. Maybe they already hacked your phone. <laughs> yeah, maybe they did. Mm. Hope the bank <laughs> account is protected. Um, thank you very much again. Thank Peter. you. Thank you. Yes.
Then I will... Let's see if this works. It's the usual problem with the... Sometimes my screen is... Oh, look. We'll see. We'll put on the next presentation. Functional Programming Primer by Deepu K. Sasidharan. Did I pronounce your name right? I'm sorry if I didn't get Close it enough. right. Yeah, it's enough. Close. Thank you <laughs> very much. Thank you very much. And you're with us from a link, actually, from Utrecht in Holland. Sorry? Yeah, you're with us from Holland. Yes, yes. yes. Um, from Utrecht. Yes. So uh, I'll go over to you and you can start your presentation. Okay. Super I real. probably have to run a bit faster. I did have no some details later coming up. No, you, you take, um, your, take your time. We will have time. We don't have a curfew. I have, to, I have to finish faster probably. Oh, you have to finish faster. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, because I, I thought this would, this would end at 8. So. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, as introduced, my name is uh, Deepu Keshashidharan. I'm the co-lead uh, developer of uh, JHipster. So if you are in the Java community, probably you have heard of it or used. It's a rapid application development platform. Also supports Kotlin, uh, uh, Node.js, uh, you know, a few other stuff, .NET and stuff. Uh, I'm also a developer advocate uh, at Adyen, a fintech company uh, based out of uh, uh, Netherlands. Uh, and OSS uh, Fishnet. And uh, Polyglot Dev as well. So you can find me on social media. I also wrote a book if you're interested in JHIP stuff. So let's uh, get into functional programming, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, before uh, we get into uh, functional programming specific uh, in Java, I uh, want to say that this is also uh, aimed uh, towards people who are not very familiar with functional programming, especially in Java. So a uh, slightly beginnerish. Uh, so if you're a uh, uh, Java expert, or if you're already a functional programming expert in Java, then this is not the uh, uh, content for you. Uh, if you are interested in learning about what are the different things that you can do within what is provided by Java uh, in terms of functional programming, then this might be for you. Um, so before we talk about Java, we quickly have to refresh uh, the basic rules of FP, right? Uh, uh, probably most of you already know this, right? So these are like the golden rules, right? No data mutations and no implicit state. So this, this kind of translates to uh, no side effects and uh, pure functions only, right? So in, in practice, so uh, an operation should not uh, change any state outside of its uh, functional scope and uh, sh a function should be uh, adherent, right? So sh a function should return values based only on the arguments. It should not be referring to external state. It should, should not be modifying external state. So these are what roughly it translates to. So this this uh, context is required uh, for the for the you know uh, for the for the content that we are going to see. Um, so uh, it's also important to set some expectations, right? Uh, so there is a difference between a functional language versus a functional style language. So a functional language is not the same as a functional style language. For example, Haskell is a pure functional language. So it does not allow mutations of state. Uh, or side effects, and it forces you to write declarative functional code. So that's a pure functional language. Whereas a functional style language allows you to write functional style code, but does not force anything or does not help you along the way, or does not make your, uh, you know, whatever you write automatically conform to the, the, the golden rules of functional programming. So the ease of doing functional or, or declarative style coding, whatever you want to call it, you know, in such a language is, really vary based on the features provided, based on what the language is, right? Um, for example, it is much more easier to write immutable or declarative code in Rust or Scala uh, or even JavaScript than in Java. So uh, those languages can be called as more functional style languages than Java, right? Um, so I'm, I'm not a functional uh, zealot uh, because I'm a polyglot developer. I use at least uh, four to five languages a week. So I cannot afford to be a functional uh, uh, programming zealot and uh, be productive at the same time. So that that's not uh, I found that not not to be possible from experience. So uh, I like to mix and match uh, paradigms based on the language that I'm working on and based on my use case. So I write to try uh, I, I try to uh, write declarative code as much as possible without having to work around or you know like uh, having to heavily uh, uh, modify everything just to be just to conform to the the functional. 
uh, 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 rules. I don't, I don't do that. Uh, and I personally haven't used uh, or am interested in any pure functional languages. I, I've found them to be too, uh, what do you call like, uh, uh, pediatric or, I don't know. I, I, I never really like like them. So I'm, I'm, I'm more in into functional style languages, which I, which I find uh, nicer for how I like to do stuff. Uh, so from from uh, so so uh, based on that, like so, there are certain things that makes a language a functional style language, or or even a functional language, right? So if if it conforms to all of that, then probably it's pure functional language. If it can do uh, these things, uh, I know in in some way, then they are functional style languages. So basically, you need to have like a strong type system, uh, functional data structures. And, and so on. So we'll, we'll look into each of this, all right? Uh, so from that in mind, we can call Java a functional style language. Of course, you can do a lot of uh, uh, these things in Java. Uh, of course, we are talking about the latest version of Java or kind of like Java 8 onwards. Um, so let's look into each of that. So uh, we'll, we'll get out uh, the, the no-brainers out of the way uh, because we don't have to explain. Uh, I, th I think I don't have to explain uh, this much uh, to most of you. If you are uh, even a Java beginner, probably you understand most of these things. So it doesn't need much introduction. So Java has a strong, strong type system, right? So there is nothing much to worry about there. So we can just get that out of the way. So it has a strong type system. It has great generic support. Uh, it can do local type inference uh, uh, with the var keyword, uh, Java 11 onwards. And it, it can also do type inference in Lambda arguments, right? So it, it conforms to the type system requirement. So that, that's like a, a, a tick for us. Uh, so the second thing that it conforms to is functional data structures. So when we are doing functional programming, certain data structures are better than others. For example, uh, you know, stacks, maps, and queues are better than arrays or uh, you know uh, uh, stuff like that. So from that aspect, because Java uh, uh, is uh, highly, uh, I mean, statically typed, it has a great inheritance support and it supports polymorphism. So it is easy to build data structures in Java as the way you want. So that means you can build any kind of functional data structures. It also provides most of the uh, uh, standard functional uh, data, uh, you know, types like stacks, maps, and queues uh, out of the box. So it's a it's a tick as well. So we are just getting these out of the way. Uh, pure functions. So when it comes to a, a, a pure function, it's quite simple, right? So you basically get some input, it produces the output, and it has to be added. And that means for the same set of input, it always has to produce the same set of outputs without side effects. So you can of course do this in uh, uh, any language for that matter, and of course you can do that in Java as well. Uh, the only problem is unlike uh, Haskell or even a language like Rust or Go, Java is not going to help you at all to make sure that you are writing fun pure functions. So you can write, uh, uh, you know, it's up to you. It's on to the developer to make sure that your functions are pure, doesn't do accidental mutations and stuff like that. So Java doesn't help you at all there. So that's why uh, uh, this is not like 100% uh, support, but you can still do it. Java just doesn't help you there, but you can still do pure functions. You just have to be more uh, uh, disciplined and you have to pay more attention, right? Uh, so the next thing, so I think this is like the uh, uh, the most important thing when it comes to uh, functional programming is of course, uh, uh, functions as first class citizens or higher order functions if you want to uh, uh, give it a fancy name, right? Uh, so this is a mixed bag in Java. Uh, for a function to be first class citizen, it should be acceptable as a variable or uh, uh, as a function argument uh, and also should be able to be uh, returned as uh, 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 from a function, right? So Java functions are not first class citizens in Java. You cannot pass Java functions into a, 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 a method or you cannot return Java functions from a method. So this was until Java 8. From Java 8 onwards, we have something called Lambda expressions that can actually bridge this gap. So let's let's uh, take a closer uh, look at what a uh, uh, Java expression is. So I'm going to switch to an uh, uh, editor for this. Um, so uh, let's see. So we have this uh, quite simple uh, Java code. I'm going to zoom it up a little bit if it is a uh, second. I think this is uh, good enough. Yeah, uh, seems good enough. 
probably smaller here. Okay, so this is just the uh, basic uh, 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 Java test class. So we create a thread, we create a new thread, and we declare a new runnable. So this in Java is uh, an anonymous uh, inner class, right? So basically you implement an interface right as, uh, into the argument. So this is possible in Java, you know, even before Java 8. So this is quite common in Java. So uh, if you run this, um, you can see that uh, it, it, it prints out uh, both these hello world statements. So as you can see, uh, I'm using IntelliJ IDEA here, and you can see it already, you know, uh, shows uh, some suggestions here. So it says, I can convert this with a lambda, right? So what, what does that mean, right? So basically, uh, a lambda is nothing but a uh, syntax sugar for removing some of the noise from a, a construct like this, which is an anonymous in a class. So basically, this is noise, right? Because we are passing something to a thread, and we know from the signature of the thread that it has to be runnable. So the the uh, so we know this, and the compiler also knows it knows this. So we can actually remove that, right? So the same here. And what else is noise? So this is also noise. Uh, it, it knows that it has to be uh, overridable. So let's remove the noise. So public void run again. It's a declaration of the uh, 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 overriding the interfaces uh, method a signature. So again, this is noise. So let's remove the noise. And what do we have left? It's a method name, uh, the arguments, and the method body, right? Again. If you have to remove stuff from here, what is useless? So this name doesn't help us in any way. It's quite useless, right? So if we do this, we we are left with the the uh, argument list of the uh, function, the function's body, which might or might not return something, right? That doesn't matter. That's from the function body. So we are uh, left with this. So now we add uh, uh, an identifier to separate the method from the uh, sorry argument list from the body and that's it so this if you run this now it's compiling and it prints out the same thing right so this is basically uh, a lambda so here we can uh, do a bit more cleanup and just since it's a single line uh, expression there is a little more uh, syntax sugar that we can do so we can remove the the, the braces here and the uh, semicolons and this becomes much more nicer so this becomes uh, let's remove this this and this right so this is what basically a lambda is so it still does the same thing it, it still uh, uh, runs and prints out the same thing so this is uh, what 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 a lambda is right so um, so objects are first-class citizens in Java. That means uh, objects can be uh, initialized uh, past uh, inline to as method arguments. So lambda is just a syntax sugar on top of this already pre-existing uh, Java stuff. And uh, now we are able to uh, pass this uh, 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 really uh, nice looking uh, uh, lambdas or equivalent of you know, what you would call uh, 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 closures or whatever, right? Uh, so this is how uh, we can actually get higher order functions. So since uh, a lambda uh, is a syntax sugar of an anonymous function, it can be passed as an argument, it can be returned uh, from a method, it can be assigned to a variable, so it confronts, confronts to uh, everything that a higher order function should do, right? So that so this is what we would use as higher order function in lambda to do functional programming, right? So. Um, what else can we do? So, uh, so this is quite, quite, quite simple example. What, what more can we do? So, Java also gives us uh, a way to create our own uh, lambda functions. Since uh, Java is uh, uh, strongly typed, uh, everything has to be, uh, you know, predefined, right? So, it creates, it, it gives us something called functional interfaces. So, we can declare our own functional interface. Uh, the annotation is just for uh, 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 documentation. It doesn't, it, it really doesn't do anything. It just to uh, indicate that it's a functional interface. So basically, you define an interface, and you define some methods in it, and you can pass this interface as function arguments. You can uh, uh, instantiate them inline, and the lambda syntax sugar allows you to uh, uh, make them into uh, uh, very readable and uh, nice-looking 
uh, uh, expressions. So let's look at uh, some. Uh, let's look at an example. Um, okay, so so uh, we have a, a array list here. Uh, so bigger? Is it uh, visible? I think so. I'm gonna make it a slightly bigger. Yeah, good enough, I think. So we have uh, an array list, and uh, let's say we want to uh, create a method called map for each, so which basically uh, iterates and maps elements of this array. Uh, so what we are going to do is first we created this functional interface, right? It takes uh, two generic uh, 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 types. Uh, so basically, it uh, has one uh, method uh, 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 declaration. So it returns type S and it takes uh, an argument of type T. So it's uh, declared as a functional interface. And then we have a method that takes a list as a, a first argument and this interface as the second argument. So within our uh, method body, we create a new array, we do a, a for each on the array, and uh, for each element of the array, we execute, we call the method uh, execute from this uh, uh, interface that we are uh, passing, right? And so the return of that is added to the array, and then we just uh, return the array. So it's it's uh, uh, simple as that. Uh, and in our uh, main function, so we are uh, passing this list, and we are creating this inline uh, anonymous function based on our function factory, right? So again, uh, we can uh, do the simplifications here. To, uh, so this already works, so let's uh, just quickly uh, run it. So it already works. So we can uh, follow the idea's uh, 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 suggestion and replace this with a lambda, right? So this looks much nicer. So now all the noise is reduced and it looks much nicer. We can go a step further and we can remove also this type information because the compiler already knows it. So again, still still works as the same right so much more nicer and we can go even a step further and actually we can replace the lambda with a method reference so it's nothing but uh, 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 replacing uh, whatever the the method is called by its reference so basically for this we'll be replacing it with string long length because it's of type string and we are just calling the uh, length method from the standard uh, string implementation so this also does the same job so we are able to define our own lambda, and we are able to uh, make this uh, 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 make this call much more nicer and much more uh, functional, right? Uh, now we can uh, actually don't even have to do this. We can even uh, use some stuff that Java already provides. For example, let's uh, go here. We saw this. Uh, so Java already provides uh, built-in functional interfaces, which can be used for most of the generic use cases. For example, there is unary operator, which takes a single argument and returns uh, a, a value. Uh, both argument and return is of the same type. We have binary operator, which takes two arguments and returns uh, something, and everything is of the, so the arguments and return will be of the same type. Then we also have a function, which can take uh, an argument and return something, and the argument and return can be of different types. Then we have a consumer, which takes a single argument but doesn't return anything. So basically uh, executes some, some sort of code, can be used when you have side effects and stuff. And then we have predicate, uh, which takes a single argument and only returns a Boolean. So basically to do tests and stuff like that, you know, assertions and kind of thing. We also have supplier, which doesn't does not take any argument but provides a return. This is useful for uh, uh, doing compute computations, so like if you want to return a random number or if you want to calculate something based on some 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 uh, logic and return something, then you can uh, use a supplier. So these are the inbuilt uh, functional interfaces under Java Util function that we can use. So now let's see what we can uh, do with that. So uh, for our uh, uh, example that we saw, we can actually uh, remove this. We don't need this, and we can just convert this to function and we call the apply method because that's the method name defined and it still does the same thing right so this is how we can use the uh, built-in uh, uh, functional interfaces 
Um, Java also provides a lot of higher order functions, built in higher order functions as well. For example, the, the util collections package has a lot of uh, 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 methods that accepts uh, uh, lambdas, like sort, binary search, min, max, all these can accept uh, lambdas. Uh, some of these are uh, uh, so yeah sorry uh, then we also have the java util stream uh, which was introduced with java 8 so this uh, package produce, provides a lot of uh, 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 methods that accepts higher order functions and they are chainable and that means we can use these as pipelines to write pure functional code and most of these functions are pure functions so we have, uh, you know, uh, the generic things that you would expect from functional languages like map, produce, filter, find, for each, so on, and, and so forth. Uh, then we also have uh, the optional uh, package, uh, which provides, uh, of course, uh, the, the optional uh, uh, implementations. It also provides functional uh, uh, methods like if present or else, filter map, and so on. So you can do a lot of stuff with optional if you want to avoid null, because null it's not something that everyone likes in Java. So if you want to avoid that, you can also wrap everything in optional and make sure that you, you don't have to deal with nuts and you can do more functional coding there. Also, any interface that, uh, you know, any Java uh, 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 implementations that accepts an anonymous class as a method argument can also take a Lambda in, in, in its place. So that's, that's also possible. So let's see if we can... Um, use those uh, with streams. So with uh, streams, uh, we can do a lot of things. For example, with the same uh, list that we had, right, uh, that, that we did here, we can also do the same thing with the inbuilt in stream. It's quite easy, right? So we just need to use the, 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 the stream method for list. It, it provides us with all the uh, niceties for, from the stream API. So we can map, produce, uh, do all of that. So we can make it a bit more nicer, this one. And uh, similarly, we can also uh, do filters and stuff. We can also make this nicer to string uppercase, right? So this, this, this does everything without even having to write uh, uh, functional interfaces ourselves, right? And another uh, uh, advantage of the stream interface is that you can do uh, parallel computations. For example, uh, uh, here we are generating uh, 5,000 uh, uh, integers and we are doing some uh, uh, pipeline on it. We are uh, filtering it, uh, we are mapping it to, uh, uh, with MathPow and uh, we are reducing them. This can be done in parallel actually. And uh, this, this would be helpful to uh, you know, uh, improve the performance when you are uh, using uh, these kind of pipelines. So I'm going to replace some lambdas here, double sum to be nicer. And let's execute this. So everything works as expected. So the, the stream API uh, offers uh, nice ways to write functional programming in Java mostly using lambdas and it makes uh, it lets us write uh, more expressive and declarative code let's see what else uh, we have so um, pure functions and higher order functions not perfect but doable right uh, you just need to have some discipline and it's still doable in java uh, next up is closures so let's see what we can do for uh, closures in java uh, let me go back to my examples so uh, a closure is basically a function that can uh, capture its uh, scope, right? Uh, it is possible in Java, but not with uh, standard functions, but with uh, lambdas again, of course. Everything uh, functional in, in, in Java is done with lambdas. So we, I have this uh, method called uh, uh, add here. It takes uh, uh, an argument. And from this add, I'm just returning a uh, new function, an anonymous inner function, right? So we will see this off again and again. So anonymous inner functions. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, anonymous inner class. I'm, I'm returning a new anonymous inner class of type function of integer integer. And then let's see what I can do with that. I'm going to format this a bit. Right, so then what I'm going, doing here is I'm going to curry this. So I'm, I'm using this add here, right? I'm, I'm creating a new closure app. I'm calling add with a predefined uh, uh, value. So I'm passing 10, 20, and 30 here, and I'm assigning the returns as new functions. 
then I can execute the new functions and apply more values to it, thus creating partials. So these are my partial curried functions, and I can pass more values and execute them to create variations. So this is how we can uh, uh, do currying in Java as well using closure. So a closure, this closure is already capturing this value, which is passed as the argument, and using that when we are doing the apply. So it can already memorize its uh, a scope. So we can make it even more uh, uh, expressive. Let me remove these comments just for to be cleaner. And I'm going to uh, replace uh, with lambda, right? So this is now much more expressive and much more nicer. So and, and this one also actually can be, I think this can be replaced with a unary or binary operator. Yeah, this can be replaced with unary operator as well. I'm not going to do that. It's, it's also, this is also fine. But you can, if you replace with unary operator, then you just have to provide one uh, uh, generic type argument. So that, that, that makes it a bit more uh, nicer. Uh, so let's uh, execute this as well, just to make sure. Yes, and you can see that it produces uh, different results based on uh, the current functions. Um, so that's about uh, uh, closures and uh, currying, right? Uh, so yeah, we saw uh, currying. So using uh, these techniques, uh, these uh, so using higher order functions using lambdas, closures with lambdas and with currying, we can do a lot of functional programming in Java. So uh, I would say you can even get away with uh, doing uh, mostly functional programming just by using these. Uh, the only caveat is you have to have the discipline because Java is not going to help you, uh, 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 you know, in a lot of ways like Haskell or uh, uh, Clojure does. So it's going, it's going to uh, uh, give all these things, and it's up to you to make uh, use of them properly, right? It's, it's up to you to avoid mutations. Of course, you can write a lambda and uh, do all your uh, 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 state mutating code there. Java is not going to uh, say anything. It's up to you. So that that that's the uh, early caveat here. So let's. Um, Let's look at uh, recursion now. So uh, again, uh, another thing that uh, we normally do uh, with uh, functional programming, uh, one second, yes. So normally do is uh, uh, avoid imperative code, right? So uh, uh, for loops and such is the most used uh, kind of imperative code, right? So how do you avoid that? Of course, with uh, uh, recursion. So, um, so recursion is possible in Java, like any other language. In every language that has uh, 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 functions, it is possible. But the real question is when to use recursion and when not to use it, right? Uh, so let's uh, look at uh, some examples here. So uh, I wrote this uh, uh, simple uh, factorial, right? Uh, of course, <laughs> factorial is the most common uh, recursive program, right? So a simple factorial function. Uh, so I have this uh, long factorial function. I'm just calling it with a value, and it produces the output. I benchmarked uh, this using JMH, uh, which is the Java micro uh, benchmarking harness. And uh, this uh, traditional iterative approach, so this is uh, the, the imper imperative uh, iterative approach, right? This produces uh, 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 close to 10 uh, nanoseconds uh, per operation. So that's, that's quite fast. So I went ahead and rewrote the same thing uh, using a recursive approach. So I, I basically uh, uh, added, uh, you know, changed that uh, function and call it uh, recursively, uh, produces the same output for the same value, but now it takes close to 20 nanoseconds per operation. So the, the performance have, uh, has become half of what we have with uh, imperative code. Of course, this is expected, right? Um, because uh, 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 recursions aren't great for performance because they add a lot of additional load to your stack because uh, the, the stack has to remember each of these function calls. It keeps that in uh, the stack memory and it is quite easy for you to, you know, uh, uh, get uh, out of uh, memory exceptions from these, uh, sorry, uh, stack overflow exceptions from these, which is quite uh, common in, in, in languages like Java. Uh, so when performance is paramount, or if the number of iterations are going to be a, a lot, and if you know that already, then probably recursion is not uh, uh, ideal here. And imperative code is would be much better here because imperative code is more low level. Uh, the stack is not overloaded like in in, in uh, recursion. Uh, so 
I would normally go with a, a iterative approach uh, within a pure function so that everything, uh, all those mutations are stuff is uh, uh, within that one function and uh, with good test cases, uh, then a recursion when performance is uh, 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 paramount. Uh, there's also another option. Another option is to uh, go with the tail recursion approach. So for a tail recursion approach, we use uh, multiple methods so that the intermediary method intermediary method doesn't have to be in your stack. So the compiler uh, can drop that safely without uh, issues and your stack will not be overloaded. So with a tail recursion approach, you might not get uh, stack overflow errors uh, like in the normal recursion method. Um, but still the performance is not as great as pure iterative method because this is still not as low level as uh, normal for loop, right? You are still adding uh, uh, abstractions and uh, uh, unfortunately ja uh, language like Java doesn't offer zero cost ab abstractions like Rust or something. So uh, once you start adding more abstractions, it's going to uh, uh, add to that uh, performance cost, right? Uh, so many languages, uh, like especially functional languages like uh, 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 Scala and stuff, uh, will optimize uh, tail recursions. So it means if you write uh, uh, recursions, uh, in, in this style as, as stale recursions, it will automatically optimize that code uh, on par with the iterative uh, uh, code. So in, in those kind of languages, you can get away with writing tail recursions and you never have to write iterative code and you still get performance as close uh, as, as your iterative approach. But unfortunately, Java doesn't support uh, 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 tail recursions. So this uh, kind of uh, uh, you know refactoring to do tail recursions will still give you better performance. For example, here we had uh, close to uh, 10 nanoseconds per operations. Uh, simple, our normal recursions had a double of that per operation. And this one has like in between that, uh, you know, uh, for operations. So if you really have to write a recursion, then tail recursions are much better. Uh, I mean, regardless of language, tail recursions are always much better than uh, plain old uh, recursions, just to avoid uh, stack overflow errors. Uh, we can also do the same thing using um, the inbuilt uh, uh, stream API, right? So uh, it's, it, it becomes a bit more, uh, um, okay, depending on how you like to read code. Some people might say this is much more readable than this. Uh, some people say, no, the other one is readable. Of course, if I made the uh, uh, arguments more expressive, then maybe this is much more readable. Uh, so that's probably on me. Uh, so this can also do the same job. Uh, but the performance is the, the worst. So I, I wouldn't recommend using uh, the Stream API for uh, recursion because it performs the worst. Uh, uh, I think it is improving slowly with each versions of Java, uh, but it is still not as good as uh, 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 tail recursion, sorry, uh, or, or you know uh, your pure imperative code. So ideally, uh, for uh, things that are very performance uh, uh, sensitive. Uh, I think uh, you know, iterative approach is still better if you make sure that uh, you know uh, uh, you're not uh, mutating data outside of that and stuff like that. It is still much better than uh, writing something functional just for the sake of it. Uh, and and if it is something trivial, then probably you can even go with the stream API. But if it is you know uh, uh, something in between, may, then maybe uh, tail recursion is uh, is a better option. So, uh, so recursions are a mixed bag. It would have been nice to have tail recursions and probably we could write uh, uh, much more expressive declarative code rather than uh, 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 unreadable for loops uh, and while loops. But unfortunately, we don't have tail recursions in Java yet. And uh, so we have only this. So uh, next uh, uh, important thing for a functional language is, uh, of course, lazy evaluations, right? Um, so let's, um, so this is, uh, 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 like a trivial uh, example I was trying to do. So let me switch to, uh, yeah, before that, like when, when writing a lot of declarative code, uh, as we saw with uh, recursion, right? So every level of abstractions we make, we are, uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, adding some performance, uh, uh, so small performance penalty. So unless you're working on uh, a language like, uh, you know, uh, Rust or C++ or something, which offers zero cost abstractions, 
uh, you're always paying for your abstractions in 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 languages like uh, Java or you know even Scala or Kotlin or whatever. You're always paying for the abstractions. And uh, um, with uh, the functional style of uh, programming, you you will be adding a lot more abstractions compared to imperative uh, style of programming because imperative is more low level than uh, uh, the uh, functional style with more abstractions and stuff, right? So. Uh, you are adding a slightly more uh, performance overhead. So in order to avoid, uh, 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 in order to balance that, most of the functional uh, programs also, uh, sorry, functional languages also do uh, lazy evaluations. So your methods are evaluated only when they are required. But unfortunately, uh, 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 Java doesn't do this. It, it does strict evaluation, uh, except for ternary and short circuit operators. So in order for us to uh, uh, do lazy evaluations, we would have to work around. There is no direct way to do that in, 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 in all places in Java, so we'd have to do some workarounds. So let's um, let's look at a, a sample here. So I wrote, wrote this uh, like trivial program. Uh, I have this program called uh, function called add or multiply. Uh, takes in uh, uh, you know like uh, two uh, values and just uh, if it is uh, based on a boolean, it returns add or multiply. Of course, this is not a useful uh, thing. You would never do that in in real life, uh, just to demonstrate uh, this concept. Because this is uh, because to do uh, uh, lazy evaluations in Java takes a little bit of convoluted coding and stuff. So probably is not the most readable things uh, thing to do. So uh, a, a sample like this probably might be easier to understand. Uh, so I have this uh, simple method which just uh, you know. Uh, uh, adds and multiplies. So let us let me run this. So when I run this, you can see that it is executing add, multiply, and uh, it is executing add and multiply for both. So for both cases, regardless of what you do, it is doing evaluation of both functions. That is because we are just calling the functions as parameters. That, so it's always evaluated. So there is no lazy evaluation here. The only way in Java to kind of achieve something closer to that would be to convert to something like this. Again, uh, lambda comes to our, uh, 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 lambda comes as a, a savior here. So uh, what I rewrote is, so for the add or multiply uh, uh, method, so let's look at that here. Um, sorry, let's look at the add or multiply here. It's, it's quite simple, right? But in our lazy sample, we have replaced uh, both the uh, arguments with uh, the functional interfaces so that we can pass lambdas there. That means we have to provide uh, type information so that we can pass dynamically, uh, dynamic, uh, I mean, uh, different types, and those can be inferred using the generics. Uh, so now you see that this is a higher order function as well because it accepts uh, uh, two lambdas, I mean, pseudo higher order functions because it's not really higher order, it's not. It's not really accepting functions, right? It's, it's just accepting interfaces, which kind of emulate or, or look like functions when using the uh, syntax sugar. So it's like a pseudo higher order function. And uh, we changed also the add and uh, uh, modify method, uh, sub, uh, multiply method. So now the add method is also a lambda instead of a normal function because we cannot pass normal functions here, right? So, um, uh, but since it is a lambda, we can also assign them to a variable and almost use it the same way. So if you look at the um, eager sample, the add and multiply functions compared to the lazy sample hasn't changed. So it looks still this almost similar. It's still readable, right? And uh, I, I would say it is even nicer because we, we, we could get rid of some type information noise, which, which the compiler could in, infer anyway, right? The only uh, 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 readability issue would be with this uh, 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 code, which was much more readable in our eager, eager sample, which was quite simple, whereas in our uh, uh, lazy uh, example, it has become a bit more, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, an unreadable kind of thing with a with lot of types and stuff going on. So now what we are doing is we are making use of uh, the fact that Java uh, lazy evaluates ternary operators. So we are uh, looking for our precondition. We are uh, using the ternary on our preconditions and calling apply methods on our functions. So when we run this uh, code, uh, if you look at the output, so only add was called when it was a true, 
and multiply was called when it was false. So this kind of uh, 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 this kind of solutions can be used to achieve uh, lazy evaluations in Java. And unfortunately, these kind of convoluted solutions are the only way to do lazy evaluations. Um, you can you can do that with ternary operators or uh, the short circuit and and or operators. It's up to you. But there is no uh, you know what do you call like catch all solutions here. So based on your requirements, you might have to uh, uh, do a lot of similar uh, implementations. You might have to rewrite your code uh, in such way. So ideally for trivial stuff, it probably is not worth doing it. Uh, so, uh, but if you have, uh, you know, some, some uh, uh, use case where there are two, uh, 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 you know, uh, heavy blocks of code, which has, uh, considerable performance impact and if your normal uh, 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 code is uh, normal functional code when you're trying to pass them are uh, not being lazily evaluated because if you just pass them as uh, uh, arguments uh, they are not going to be lazily evaluated they will be strictly evaluated so you can kind of use lambdas to rewrite them and with the functional interfaces you can kind of play around and kind of get a lazy evaluations but again on a use to use case basis you might have to re-implement it per per need unless you have all your methods, you know, confronting to the same generic case. Uh, maybe if you spend enough time, you can come up with a solution which is quite generic for a lot of, lot of cases. So from, from that angle, uh, lazy evaluations are still, uh, it's not like a, it's still a mixed bag. So I'm, 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 as you can see, I'm putting some smileys. So type system and the functional data is like, all good like it's as good as any other functional language and the other stuff like pure functions higher order functions and closures and currying is like it's not it, it's not like pure higher order functions or anything but it's it's close enough uh, it, it's uh, you know it's syntax sugar and pseudo higher order functions but in in effect they do the same thing as higher order functions in other language so in the end you will get the same result it will look almost the same uh, there is no much uh, overhead except for you know having to add these uh, functional type interfaces for some use cases if it you know if it doesn't fit the normal uh, unary binary or the function uh, uh, declarations so for example if you want to pass three arguments then you have to write your own uh, so anything more than two arguments you would have to uh, write your own and if it uh, works with more than one uh, uh, more than two day uh, uh, you know, uh, type, then you would have to write your own. So those are the overheads compared to other functional languages. So the final thing would be uh, referential uh, uh, transparency. So uh, referential transparency is nothing but uh, 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 languages ability to not let you do uh, data mutations kind of. So few functional languages like Haskell doesn't let you do assignments and hence forbids data mutations. But uh, an OOP language like uh, Java actually encourages data mutation. So OOP is all about mutating, you know, having your uh, 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 data in, in your objects and mutating them. So it's, it's designed for muta with mutation in mind. And it's, it's like almost like fighting against it when you are trying to do immutable code in Java. So the compiler wouldn't help you at all with this. So it is really easy to do accidental mutations in Java. I mean, uh, and since Java also passes arguments by reference you know except for primitives everything is passed as reference so that means it is even more uh, uh, easy to accidentally mutate something you might be passing mm, like an, an object to a pure function and unknowingly you might be you know uh, changing something and a lot of uh, um, inbuilt java methods right like the default java methods could also be mutating methods so you might be doing it accidentally you might be doing us you might be passing a collection to your pure function and you might be calling the sort uh, sort method on that and which it's a mutating method so it's going to sort the collection in place and since it's a reference it's going to affect everything else so it doesn't help so in java it is extremely easy to do accidental mutations and honestly there isn't uh, you know any way to uh, uh, prevent accidental mutations uh, and uh, of course java provides the final keyword but i am like in my opinion it's just it's a joke it's it's as useless as the const in uh, javascript of course it will prevent uh, reassignment of the uh, uh, you know variable but i don't think you will you uh, i don't think people normally make mistakes by reassignment most of the mutation mistakes comes from uh, mutating uh, uh, reference so the final keyword doesn't uh, stop you from mutating uh, 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 you know a field inside a, a, a final uh, object right 
So it's, it still lets you do that and there is uh, no indication of you doing that. So that a compiler doesn't help you uh, uh, anyway there. So uh, in the end, uh, referential transparency is completely up to the developer. So if you're writing pure functions, it's up to you to make sure that you're not doing uh, mutations. There is no way for uh, the compiler, I mean, there's no way the compiler is going to help you uh, in, in any case. Uh, so if you compare it like, uh, uh, you know, compare this with uh, languages like, uh, uh, you know, other non-functional languages, like, for example, Go and Rust are imperative languages, like, like they are majorly imperative, but they also let you do uh, functional programming. But those languages actually give you greater control in uh, ensuring that uh, there is referential transparency. For example, uh, in, 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 in Go, you, you you can pass uh, you know uh, arguments to a function by reference or by value so you can choose to pass by value that means you are not going to accidentally uh, uh, affect state outside of that function right so uh, for and, and, and rust actually even goes a step further because in all in rust also you can pass uh, everything by value or reference but it goes a step further uh, everything in rust by default is immutable so if you have to mutate something, you have to explicitly declare that to be mutable. So it, that, 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 that holds true for variable declarations, passing uh, variables to uh, you know, functions, so whatever it is. You always have to uh, declare that something is mutable explicitly, which makes it extremely easy to write immutable code in, in, in a language like Rust or even in Go. And, and uh, the compiler will uh, uh, catch if you are uh, accidentally mutating something. I mean, I have been doing uh, Rust, uh, 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 like I'm building a project in Rust for like last few weeks, and I mean, there was no, uh, uh, there was not even a single instance where I uh, accidentally, you know, mutated something, and and it was a uh, heavily concurrent uh, uh, application with uh, shared state, uh, shared state, uh, uh, you know, uh, mutex uh, data, so. There was like no way I could do that in Java without, uh, you know, uh, uh, having to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, uh, finding out uh, bugs that is accidentally created by accidentally mutating stuff, right? And and in a language like Rust, you can you can confidently go ahead and mutate stuff, and you you can be sure that you are not accidentally mutating state outside of a function. So that is extremely nice. So it's hard to appreciate uh, these kind of features unless you know you you work on a language like that. So in, in Java, referential transparency is, is, is quite difficult. Uh, I, I, I would even, I would rank, uh, I think I would, I, I would rank, you know, like uh, Rust and Go much higher than Java, even JavaScript uh, and TypeScript, uh, sorry, not, not JavaScript, but TypeScript can be ranked much higher than Java when it comes to referential transparency. So th this is the, the, the weakest part of Java when it comes to functional programming. And I think this is the, probably the, the, the reason that you know, that, that you would end up spending much more time doing functional programming in, in Java compared to other languages. So, yes, so Java can be functional style language if you are patient and disciplined. So, um, like, like, you know, um, I'm, I'm not trying to say that uh, you shouldn't be doing functional programming in, uh, in, in, in Java. It is still much nicer to do write declarative code using you know stream APIs and optionals than writing imperative code for most of use cases. But I don't think uh, if, you, if you try to write 100% functional code in Java, I think you'll be fighting the language a lot. And I don't think you'll be as productive as, uh, you know, uh, uh, like as productive as mixing both. Uh, because Java is not a functional language. It's, it's just a language that lets you write functional style code. So yeah, that's it. Uh, I, I hope uh, this was useful in some extent. I also have the same, uh, I also have a blog version of this. You can find it in my website under the functional tag. I have uh, a blog for uh, with, with similar structure for uh, Java, TypeScript, Go and Rust. So if you are interested to compare how this looks in different uh, these different languages please check it out and you can always reach out to me via twitter or uh, uh, via my website if you have uh, uh, comments or questions uh, of course this was more uh, for a uh, uh, for for beginners kind of thing uh, if you're an expert then you uh, probably already know all this so one thing i again want to highlight uh, is uh, 
probably yeah the yeah the the power of uh, using lambdas for closures and uh, uh, the power of uh, it? yeah the power of using lambdas for closures and currying so this is not something that normally people do in java i mean at least i haven't seen i mean i have worked with a lot of java code bases and i have never seen anyone doing currying in java whereas in uh, uh, like javascript and and those kind of languages it's extremely common to see currying uh, but I see, uh, but I would say that this is something that you can actually uh, use a lot in Java, uh, and you can, you know, uh, make your code much more dry with this. You can you can do a lot of uh, uh, code variations and do much more functional style of declarative coding using curry. So try to make use of curry. It's quite quite simple. I mean, there is no much overhead except for uh, declaring this this one, you know, this this kind of function and and that also with lambda becomes much more concise so it's not not much overhead at all to to do currying in java so uh, thank you i hope this was useful uh, yeah i can take some questions if you have any i haven't got any questions in the chat so far thank you very much deeper for your very nice presentation it was uh, it was really good and thanks also for the summarization this is what java is good at and this is uh, well <laughs> <laughs> where you shouldn't do stuff like tail recursion <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or head recursion. <laughs> I've seen it. Uh, I mean, I've done it in C, and yes, you fill up the stack and boom, <laughs> your stack overflows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in Java, it's even easier to do that, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah I, I couldn't go about 20. No, absolutely not. I would. Yeah, 20 I would. is the maximum I could go with this. Yes. Yeah. Oh, 20, and then it would just. Kill you. Yeah, after 20, it just explodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the normal recursion. So yeah. 20 was the max. <laughs> also, like, like you did other languages. What other languages? You said you work with Rust now, Go. Other languages you're working with? Yeah, so uh, so I predominantly do uh, Java, JavaScript, Go, and Rust. So that's my major languages. So uh, I think, so, yeah, recently I have been doing a lot of Rust and Go. Um, uh, I was building a command line uh, tool in Rust. So it's a lovely language. I'm I'm falling in love with it. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it it it's really nice. And and you know like uh, when I mean I, I don't like uh, languages which has lot of uh, like like I I don't like Scala for example. I find it. Uh, I mean I I know where why people like it, but I don't find it uh, very beginner friendly or like very readable. I have worked in teams where everything was in Scala and like most of the time spent is trying to understand code. It was like, <laughs> okay. because of all that like implicit stuff. I mean, it, it doesn't have implicit, implicit state mutations, but mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, implicit magic happening, right? Like for example, like all those, uh, what is that? I forgot what that, there is some implicit stuff that automatically applies to methods and stuff. Like it's quite hard to know that there, it, these stuff are even there unless you find a bug or like, then you have to, you don't even know. Like even the people who wrote that, like after a few years, like nobody, like, Everyone was looking into this one error. Like nobody understands why this happens. Like then, like after like like what day or something of debugging, then somebody ah oh, okay, there is this implicit transformation on this. Like ah uh, okay, like why why would you do that? Like mm. so yeah so like you know because I, I I felt that all those extra semantic complexity mm. probably wasn't worth it because in the end it is still running on JVM. It's not like a it's not like uh, zero cost abstractions or stuff, right? And and Rust also has similar uh, complexities, not as complex as, I mean, semantics are not as complex as uh, Scala, in my opinion. But the, there is still a lot of uh, complex semantics in terms of lifetimes and, uh, you know, complex generics and stuff. But it is worth it, in my opinion, because of the zero cost abstraction factor and because of no garbage collection or anything. Like, it's just manages memory automatically and like writing functional code in rust is like a like like really nice it it yeah it, it wouldn't let you like you know you can explicitly uh, write both in the same thing i mean it's not like fighting with haskell when sometimes you have to do something non-functional and you have to spend uh, you know fighting the language over it like you know it's not like that i i really don't like doing that because i believe that there is use cases for both like functional program 100 percent functional yes. programming is not answer to anything uh, yeah. Same way, oops was not the answer to everything like you know 20 years ago. So yeah, this good mix uh, is quite nice. Like uh, you can choose to do both, but you can choose to do both in a really nice way. So yeah. that's that's quite nice. You seem to have done a lot of languages. Have you learned a lot of different computer languages? Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I really like uh, 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 trying out languages. Like, uh, and and if I like the language, then I I, I kind of stick to it. So I think I I tried around ten, twelve languages, and these like yeah, like Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, and Go and Rust are like like my favorite. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kotlin is also nice, but I didn't get chance to do a lot of Kotlin except for some Android stuff. So, but it also it's nice. Like, I, I did some Groovy in the past, but it wasn't that uh, you know impressive. I mean, it mm-hmm. it was it felt like just syntax sugar over uh, Java and Scala was like uh, was not my cup of tea. <laughs> so, okay, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of course there is Ruby, Python, and those stuff. Again, I, I'm I'm, yep. I'm not a fan of those. Mm-hmm. I, I tried, but like. Uh, Would you say you become a better developer once you learned more languages, understanding the different structures, yes. and ups and downs of the languages? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I was able to. Uh, I think there was things I learned from one language which I could apply to the other. Mm-hmm. Just have to change the semantics a little bit, but I could I could apply that to uh, you know uh, in in other places. And uh, I feel like once you learn uh, three or four languages, then learning a new language becomes extremely easy mm-hmm. because in the end the the, the The principles are almost the same. It's just the syntax that differs, and some new things that some language might offer. So you just have to learn that. For example, like learning Rust was quite easy for me uh, because some things was quite similar to Go, which are already new. So mm-hmm. I didn't have to learn that part explicitly. The only thing I had to like learn new was the lifetime and the ownership concepts. Everything else felt almost the same. I mean, there was a lot of similarities to TypeScript, which I could just reapply. Like you know, some similarities. I mean, generics was like. As same as in Java, right? So except for it, some complexities in some places, which you wouldn't always do, ex- like sometimes, which you can always get help from community on, in those kind of cases. But I think, like, yeah, um, it definitely helped me uh, uh, become a better, better programmer. Definitely. Yeah. Again, thank you very much for your presentation. Really like it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank And you. we will put yeah. out all the like yeah. the sources, links to blogs, and everything <laughs> under the under the YouTube film once it's out. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And see you. That, yes, and that's it. Uh, we'll come back uh, in 26 of May for uh, another meetup. Uh, and if you have anything to present, or you have no someone that should present, uh, either poke them or poke me, and I will uh, chase them up and get them here to present. Uh, and we can have people either on Link or here in the studio in Stockholm. Uh, and that's it. And thank you for tonight. And thanks everyone for following all like all three presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>